Hi there, my name is Jason Deong. Thanks for tuning in and welcome to my 2022 shotgun hunting adventure that I'm calling Tracking Winter Whitetail. In previous hunting seasons, I've focused on exploring the limitations of a variety of 12 gauge buckshot, so wanting something different this year, it's low recoil slugs through my all weather Mossberg 590 shockwave. It's set up with a slightly longer synthetic forend to help push the gun further from my face, a factory fixed cylinder bore, and I've installed an XS Sights Big Dot Tritium whose tall height helps bring the gun's point of impact back in line with point of aim. It can be a big handful to shoot using standard 12 gauge ammo, so I'm grateful that there are low recoil alternatives available and one of my favorites is this 1200 foot per second one ounce foster slug made by Remington. One of my favorite guns of all time, I had a literal blast throughout the summer and early fall making sure I understood the combo's trajectory and what my range limitations might be. With the gun's super huge big dot tritium sight and unique stockless broom handle, this worked out to about 50 yards. It took a couple of weekends of focused practice, but by mid-fall, from both standing and kneeling positions, I could comfortably put slug after slug through the 7-inch target aperture of my life-sized AR500 steel deer. Over the years, my comment section have seen a lot of contradictory debate around the potential velocity drawbacks of short-barreled shotguns. Curious to find out myself, I put together a 24-inch barreled 590 build to go find out. In a controlled environment chrono session, it didn't take long to reveal the 14-inch barrel only suffers about a 100 foot per second penalty relative to a 24-inch barrel. And given my range limitation, I figured this was hardly any handicap at all. I was also interested in comparing some slugs fired from the shockwave to those fired from shotguns with longer barrels, as well as those I've recovered from deer shot in earlier seasons. So I ran a couple of rounds into totes filled with swamp water to enable recovery and inspection. Here's an unfired slug atop the hard polymer puck that both takes up space in the hull and also pushes like a piston. I cut one down at center line to check out its cross section and you can see that it does have thin walls at the base which thicken towards the slug's meplat. Internet lore would have us believe that this nose heavy design is responsible for the slug's stable aerodynamics, but I think about it differently. When fired, the polymer puck pushes on the thin walls of the back end of the slug, compressing it into a puck that's about two-thirds the length of the unfired projectile. As this happens, the slug obturates against the wall of the barrel, and friction with the slug's rifling imparts some amount of spin, which I think is the driving force of its stability. I've wondered to what extent barrel length influences the degree to which the slug is compressed. It seems like very little, as this slug was fired from a 14-inch barreled shockwave, and this other one was fired through the cylinder bore of a 21-inch smoothbore barrel. The only difference I can detect is the degree of smearing on the slug's rifling. So how does all this align with performance in the real world? Well, here's a Remington managed recoil slug recovered from a large whitetail doe I slugged with my Benelli M4 in winter of 2013. And here's another recovered in 2012 from a mule deer slugged with my Remington 870 Special Purpose Marine Mag. Both shot quartering, the slugs traveled diagonally through their deer, breaking major limb bones and were recovered from an offside limb just under the skin. They both exhibit very similar pancake-like compression, and you can see their may plates are asymmetrically deformed, likely from angled impact with the bones they broke. I've yet to recover a managed recoil slug from a deer shot broadside, and this from a sample size of about a dozen, so my feeling is it's unlikely to happen. Anyway. I felt reasonably prepared to come opening of the general season, and I was really excited when the first snowstorm blew in early, as another of my goals this year was to rely less on ambush hunting, and more on some combination of still hunting with fresh track following. So I spent the season's bad weather days slowly walking through the woods, making sure to stop and look carefully, trying really hard to see deeply into the surrounding forest. The snow began to accumulate, and over the next few days, a whole new dimension of the forest emerged as I started cutting tracks. I followed miniature-like dinosaur tracks, meandering through the scrub and bottoms of the spruce, leading to a ruffed grouse perched just off the forest floor. Her feathered snowshoe-like feet were amazing, and seeing her puff out the rest of her feathers made me feel warm while the temperature steadily dropped. I followed mysteriously parallel bounding tracks, 
and it was really cool to discover they led to a North American pine marten who was just as comfortable systematically searching the upper tree canopy as he was combing through the ground cover. Watching him easily hurl himself from tree to tree made it easy for me to imagine the terror a squirrel might feel, and super lucky for something of a rare encounter. I also followed a pair of these large tracks to come across a fascinating tale told in the snow of an epic struggle between deer and predators especially adapted to hunting them, this time resulting in a meal for a couple of hungry cats. I stood there, wondering if I might be mistaken about who was hunting who, then chose to call it a day and limit discovery of these two magnificent creatures to the lens of my trail camera. A couple of days later, another front blew through with noise and nose-canceling high winds that were combined with a bizarre snow-melting chinook of intermittent fresh wet snow flurries. I came across a whitetail track that I felt was less than 10 minutes old, so I excitedly set to watchful and careful pursuit through the woods. The weather was really unsettled, with periods of on and off again heavy snowfall and the wind building to sound like fast running water as it flowed through the trees and dry grass. The forest filled wind noise made it possible to move more quickly and try to gain ground on the track, but as much as it flowed, it also pulled back to create pockets in time when moving made way too much noise. I used these holes in the wind to slow down, glass through the trees, and try really hard to see into the spaces and openings beyond. It's a really engaging and interactive way to hunt, and it paid off big time, because suddenly, there he was. <laughs> The seer had broke over excellent sight picture, so I sat down for a half an hour to burn off a bit of the adrenaline I had just dumped into my bloodstream. While I waited, the snow and wind died back, which made finding the recovery track a reasonably simple affair. So feeling pretty optimistic, I carefully set out to follow. Even though I was pretty excited and the blood trail was pretty good, experiences taught me to continue to move slowly, stop often, and really, really look. Just because I feel good about the shot doesn't mean it actually was a really good shot, and by moving slowly and quietly on a recovery track, I feel like I give myself the best chance at being able to hammer another slug home if it turns out the first one was lacking in some regard. I made my final approach with the gun at the ready, carefully looking for signs of life and making sure I had a plan to drop the camera and get that gun back into action if needed. Wary about sharp horns and hooves, I stayed a red alert until the eyeball test confirmed he was, in fact, dead. Wow, I'm really grateful for a winter of whitetail slugged with my shockwave. Let's get him open and check out what that slug did. Here's a nice sized entrance hole passing between two ribs, and it looks like I got lucky with my shot placement for a solid hit through the heart and some double lung action. Lots of sloshy oxygenated blood and a similar rib dodging exit hole on the other side. And amazing to me that with a hole like this through his heart, he was still able to go 50 yards. After peeling off his hide, I could see that the slug had just clipped muscle and connective tissue on his near side leg, but then passed clear through his thorax with clean sailing out the other side. With my whole family grateful for the bounty of steaks, roasts, and ground, it was time for one of our favorite meals. A simple steak cooked over a very hot open gas flame. I prepped the steak by rubbing in a bit of virgin olive oil and seasoning both sides with some Montreal steak spice. They go onto a really hot grill for a minute and 30 seconds twice on each side. And I finish them with a bit of butter to ease out the leanness of wild game. I let them rest on the plate for a couple of minutes before the family comes to chow down and there is no such thing as leftovers. Anyway, I had a lot of fun sharing my hunt with you and hope fortune makes it possible to share others in the years to come. Thanks for watching and goodbye for now.